I grew up not too far away from here in the wonderful city of Alain. Though I'm originally from Bangladesh, so a conflicted third culture kid. When I was growing up, I remember how expensive it was for my parents to call their family back home. In fact, it was so expensive that at times they would actually record their updates and stories and into audio cassettes and snail mail them back to family. And I'm not talking about the Neolithic period here. This was the archaic millennium of 2001, the pre-Skype days. Dial-up was already available at home. Do you guys remember where you couldn't connect the telephone when you were using the internet? Or perhaps the dial tone that you had to dial up to the internet. It was a very different world out there, kids out today. So, and with our dial-up internet, we were already streaming music. So, when I looked at the problem that my parents were facing, so I knew the pieces were out there, but a solution was just not put together. And the existing way of calling using your Rory telephone network was expensive. So I set out seeing this problem, and I was confident that I could find a solution around it. And that's what I did at around age 13. I had founded a voice over the internet product that allowed my parents to call family back home over the internet. And the way I did that was I had cold called lots of technology companies that would sell big boxes like these, and I would spend hours with them on the telephone, and eventually I'd ask them to email me their documentation on my fancy Hotmail address, which I would pour hours on, and then that's how I learned about the technology. Eventually, I had the solution where my parents could talk over the internet to their family, and they were quite happy about it. And the companies on the other end of the line actually had no idea that a 13-year-old was speaking to them and buying their systems. So with a successful pilot, I was eventually able to provide the solution to people who needed it the most, the workers that you see here, who didn't have access to technology, were usually much further away from home, from family, and didn't have the means to call. So I gave them a solution where they would pick up a telephone, just like a normal piece of telephone, and then the calls would go over the internet. So by age 16, my business had made enough money that I was able to cover all my tuition fee as an international student to any college I wanted. And that was quite a lot for a 16-year-old. And none of my friends knew that I actually used to take business calls in school washrooms during the school hours. <laughs> and I actually you know, didn't like sharing that, because all I saw was a problem, and I wanted to help people, so I built a solution around it. But eventually, I actually had to wrap up the business, because I couldn't convince my Asian parents to let me drop out of university to focus on the business. So juggling a growing business while being in college was just a no-go. I ended up in a small college out in Canada at a university called the University of Waterloo. And if any of you have heard about Waterloo in the last few years, you probably know Waterloo as the feeder university to Silicon Valley. And being in Waterloo, I really felt like I found my tribe of eccentric and weird people who also wanted to change the world. To the point that, first week of college, I remember meeting a guy who had sold his company to Yahoo for a couple million dollars. Wow, that's amazing. And for a small kid who grew up in the Middle East in a small city, suddenly the world felt like it was full of opportunities. To the point when it was 2007 and 2008, the whole app craze had spread across campus. All of us were trying to build the next photo sharing app. And some of my friends were out in Silicon Valley trying to build technology to trick people into clicking the next ads. Oh, the bubble we were living in. We were trying to build technology for a small set of, subset of people right at the top. While I felt really at home in Waterloo with all these weird tribe members, I felt a little bit conflicted. 
I'm really passionate about technology and really believe in the power that it has in changing lives and improving the world for better. So one summer, I actually took a trip to Bangladesh, where I worked for the Nobel Peace Prize winning Grameen Bank under the leadership of Mohammed Yunus, who was the pioneer of microfinance. Now, Grameen Bank was actually looking at technologies that was affecting socioeconomic development because they'd found a great benefit in what cell phones had done in these communities. So I ended up working on this project where we were building telemedicine kiosks for rural communities that didn't have access to care. The one thing we actually realized was even though we were providing access to care, a lot of the complex cases weren't actually being solved because the doctors on the other side were actually quite young. So that actually opened my eyes to a whole new set of problems that I thought technology could solve. And it's interesting to actually pause here and reflect on the irony. Here I was in rural Bangladesh, over 5,000 miles away from Canada, where my friends were trying to build the next big app, and I was pondering the impact technology could have on changing lives. I kind of felt like my life was shifting there a little bit. To give you some perspective, in Bangladesh, about 70% of the population live in rural areas, 70%. So an average healthcare facility is approximately 13 kilometers to an average citizen. Now, 13 kilometers for us here in Dubai may not sound like a bad deal. You hop into your fast car, drive down the highway, and it's a 15-minute ride to max, not a big deal. But for communities that don't have access to cars, with no roads, water-clogged environments, while they're sick, this ordeal can take up to three hours, if not longer. And imagine a scenario where you end up at the hospital and the doctor didn't show up that day. Or maybe you borrowed some money from family and took an even longer trip, or maybe abroad, to find out that a doctor told you that your diagnostic results have come out negative, so you just go back home. But now you have debt. <clears throat> so, it was very interesting to work in Bangladesh, and this is where we understood the impact of what technology could do in developing countries. So I went back to Canada being really passionate on the kind of technologies I could build that really mattered and would change lives. Now, in North America, it was very difficult to work on healthcare technologies because of regulation issues. And some of the ideas that I was pondering actually felt fit for developing countries. So that's where we got started. I co-founded a healthcare startup that provided world-class healthcare to underserved communities that didn't have access to medical care. And just like my early rendition of Skype days, I knew the pieces were already there. I was just amazed at how cell phone connectivity had spread all across the world. And increasingly, 3G was there. So at our startup, we used 3G connectivity to provide healthcare access to underserved areas. And this is how we do it. We provide a piece of hardware to these facilities. Our hardware consists of a simple mobile processor. We've put some battery backup. And we've connected multiple 3G internet connections to increase the speed. And we give this hardware out for free. It just costs us a couple of hundred dollars. And a hospital in Afghanistan, for example, would partner with us and we'd put down our hardware, and then afterwards, a patient would walk into a facility, work with their local GP, and their local GP would most likely prescribe a battery of diagnostic tests, so a CT, X-ray, MRI, depending on the condition, or some lab results. And then our hardware would collate all that information out, and we would transmit it over to our global network of doctors, that would provide a speedy diagnosis to return it back to that local doctor 
who now was better equipped and more informed to provide better treatment to their patient. So far, in our 18 months of operation, we've actually treated over 6,000 patients. We've been able to save lives, literally. And I'll give you the example of a guy named Abdullah. Abdullah is the sole breadwinner of his family of seven in Kabul, Afghanistan. He walked into one of our facilities and very soon we found out that he had a perforated colon. Because of our consultation, doctors were able to operate on him immediately and his life was saved. If he did not get that procedure right then, he would not have made it. If he didn't make it, the lives of his family of seven and their fate would have been unknown today. Similarly, we've actually been treating young mothers, cancer patients, tumor cases, and a lot more. And in developing countries, these solutions are more needed because patients wouldn't actually visit a healthcare facility until the very last moment when it's way too late. So what we're actually also doing is reducing the cost of providing care by building up a very large repository of medical data and applying machine learning on it so we can apply pre-diagnoses to it before a specialist has even looked at it. So as a result, we can provide healthcare cheaply, faster, and reliably. So people can stay healthy for longer. So, so far, we've been able to provide our solutions successfully in Nigeria, Sudan, and Afghanistan, and we're hoping to grow this. And now I think fondly to my days uh, when I was running my business from the high school. And I look back, and on one side, I see people competing over the next text bubble to build the next photo sharing app. But I still feel like there are lots of important technologies in the world that can be implemented to change lives. And if we look at these problems with the same tenacity, drive, and passion that we do with the next Silicon Valley unicorn startup, we would be able to build a much better world. And some of these pieces are already available in front of you. You don't need anything magical to happen for them to come to place. You just need to look around, see what's available for you, join the dots to come up with a solution to change the face of healthcare or maybe other aspects. I hope this was an idea worth spreading and has shifted your perspective on the change that we can provide in providing access to basic healthcare and the impact technology has on it. Thank you.